Hello, everyone, and thank you all for tuning in to another episode of the OASTA Swap Show. I'm Nikki, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Janisa, and our new co-host, Shri. Hey, guys. All right. We have a great Hello. show for you planned. Hey. We have a great show for you planned as we're joined by Neil Matatal, who's going to tell us why password hygiene is super important. Maybe not more important than brush your teeth, but it's definitely up there. Neil has an extensive background in application security, and he has worked at corporations and startups on all kinds of stacks. But at the heart of it, it always has been about security. Over to you, Shanisa. Sorry, Shri, oh, please yes, tell us a little yeah. bit about yourself. <laughs> yeah, Can't... welcome. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Shri. I am pretty new to the field of security. I've been working on security stuff for about a year, so definitely not as long as any of you. Um, I right now work on a product. It's called Azure AD Entitlement Management. So this helps organizations manage uh, identity, access lifecycle, that kind of stuff. So yeah, I'm pretty excited. I'm Safety is one of my core values, so I am really looking forward to learning about new challenges and uh, what does the future look like for online safety? Thank you. Yeah, good to have you here, Shri. And really excited to have Neil today. But before we introduce Neil a little, a little bit more, um, a few words from our sponsor, AppSec Engineer. Application security is in more demand than ever, but companies still can't find enough talent. You could be filling those vacancies right now. There's just one problem. A career in AppSec means learning new skills in both offensive and defensive security across disciplines like DevSecOps, cloud security, threat modeling, and more. Whoa, that sounds like a lot. <laughs> but don't worry, we got you covered. AppSec Engineer is an all-in-one training platform with over 30 courses in 8 fields of AppSec. Every lesson comes with hands-on labs so you can practice all your skills to perfection. All that for just one subscription, like Netflix, but good for your career. If you want to learn AppSec, you gotta do it right. You gotta choose AppSec Engineer. Get started for free today. So thank you for being with us here today, Neil. Um, we're really excited to learn why MFA isn't enough to protect ourselves from mass account takeover. And I will let you take it away. Great, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. This is uh, kind of the first sort of talk I've given on this subject in a very comprehensive way. And I really enjoy this kind of work. And the whole point of this is I hope to present a story that's repeatable, um, might not necessarily be considered easy, uh, but hopefully I can give you enough information that you can take these uh, strategies directly back to your, your employer and get to work on them. And I even go so far as to give exact database schemas and everything. So just kind of setting the stage, this is a purely hypothetical story. It is based on, on a collection of work. Um, so this is a fake company named SVN Slop. And if you don't know what SVN stands for, um, it was a popular version. Well, it's an older version control system um, that came before, you know, Git, which is now sort of mostly taken over. Uh, just again, sort of setting the stage of where we were. This is a, you know, hypothetical year, 10 years in the past, whatever. Um, we've made the service very easy to use. You know, it's a very simple command line interface or a GUI interface. It's very easy to get started because all you need is a password. There's no complicated setup involved. Um, and as, if, as it came to your actual account, the only options available to protect you were actually 2FA and rate limits. So your password couldn't be brute force, which is obviously you know, a big deal. Um, but if you wanted sort of any extra protection, you had to opt into 2FA. Um, at the time, we sort of felt good about where AppSec was. You know, XSS and SQL injection weren't really a concern of ours anymore. So kind of investing more in that area didn't make a whole lot of sense. Doesn't mean we can completely abandon it, but uh, you, don't, you don't need a whole team of people working on that if, if things are in a good place. But the, the sort of source of, of new information did not come from internal assessments or external assessments or bug bounties, but instead from support requests. People would write in and say, I didn't write that comment, or I didn't delete that data, or... I, you know, my, my account has been completely taken over. Um, you know, traditionally we'd say like, oh, like, was there an XSS bug? Was there SQL injection? But we just said that like, no, like we're pretty sure those aren't the problem. So what is the problem? Um, we didn't really have a good idea of what was going on because our only source of information was when people are right into us, letting us know that their account, you know, has been hacked. And it can be easy to sort of, you know, put this on the user in a sense. You know, you can say that they might have been fished, or maybe there's malware or a malicious browser extension. It's really easy to blame these things. Um, but in the end, it's just, you know, we have to make it easy for humans. And the frequency at which these things were happening and sort of the breadth of the accounts that were involved 
did not seem targeted in any way. It just seemed like a very high volume. So, you know, we had 2FA, but our accounts are getting hacked. That is a clear signal that you cannot depend on 2FA uh, because people won't use it. And, you know, honestly, I can't blame them. It's kind of a mess. And I think it's really easy for security pros to sort of get up on a soapbox and, and shun anyone whose accounts got hacked because they didn't have 2FA when the same security pros are getting their accounts popped for not having 2FA as well. Uh, 2FA mandates work well in the workplace in which you can control all the access for your users. But if you are not in control of your users or you, know, you cannot just ask your admin to reset your 2FA credentials, it's not gonna be anywhere close to 100%. So uh, this is a survey from Connor Gill. He, he keeps it sort of updated. This is all self-reported. There's, there's no really like standards on this, but nobody really has any motivation to lie about these numbers. So let's just assume that they're true. Um, one to 20% across all the companies is not very good. Um, if you look at the very bottom there, we have Dropbox at less than 1%. Granted, this number was in 2016. I would be shocked if that number changed drastically. Um, someone like GitHub is at 15%, which is just astronomically high when you compare it to someone like Twitter. Um, you know, you could say that the user bases are different, and that is true to some degree, and that will reflect these numbers in somewhat. But if you think GitHub is a site full of technical people that only has 15% adoption, that's pretty bad. Um, and, you know, can you really blame people? Like, everyone's had that experience where they got locked out of a 2FA account, myself included. Um, it's really annoying to get your account hacked. It's even more annoying to not be able to access your account legitimately. Um, the experience is inconsistent across all different sites. Some are SMS, some are OTP, some are both, some are a little bit of uh, security keys, uh, the recovery stories, backup codes, backup phone numbers, account delegation, social verification, government ID verification. You know, depending on, on the application, all these different options can be wildly confusing. And again, a security pro might have experienced all these things in their life, but you cannot assume that the 85% of people who don't enroll in 2FA haven't had one of these bad experiences before. And just to sort yeah. of dig in. Oh. It's, sorry, I was just going to say, I think just very recently, you're able to now export your Google Authenticator, um, co like you know all the accounts you have onboarded to a new phone if you were to get a new phone. Because I've definitely been through that, where it's a giant mess if you're migrating phones to re-enable all of those accounts on your new phone. So I hear you. It's, it's not user, the user experience is not always so friendly there. So on that point about Google Authenticator and about the fact that they only recently added backup support, I feel comfortable saying that Google Authenticator is one of the biggest contributors to people not liking 2FA because they've been in that experience. It was the most common OTP application for the longest time. It didn't support backups. Things like Authy came around where you could backup your OTP codes and store multiple in the same place. And the idea of putting your OTP codes in one password became really common. And guess what Authy and one password have? Backups. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, I think the second line here, you know, new phone, who dis? Like every time a new iPhone would come out, there would be a wave of people who are locked out of their accounts because, you know, they, when they transfer their apps, they didn't realize that it didn't transfer their OTP seed. And they were so, you know, interested in getting the money back for their old phone. They just deleted and shipped it off before actually, you know, using their phone. And, you know, to say that is an uncommon experience across technical and non-technical people would not be true. Totally. Um, so Google Authenticator, I blame you. <laughs> I heard that, that there's something called Microsoft Authenticator. I'm not yeah. at all biased uh, when I say that this is a great product. So, when, <laughs> so uh, in, our, in our documentation, we would uh, literally suggest clients and exclude ones we didn't want to include. Um, and then the Microsoft Authenticator started to gain popularity. And so we said, like, does this meet our criteria? Does it survive backups? Does it have some sort of recovery mechanism? And it absolutely did. So I, I feel comfortable recommending Microsoft Authenticator as well. Um, so yeah, like I said, 2FA implementations across the internet are very inconsistent. Um, I think SMS is a great option for most people because it is the easiest. It survives new phones. Um, you know, it, people getting new phone numbers is not unheard of, but it's uncommon. Um, some people have had the same phone number their entire lives. But, you know, it's, it's been in the news lately because some high profile targeted attacks would use uh, SIM swapping to gain access to that phone number. Um, whether or not this is an actual attack that could bother you is up to you to decide, but I think Google has said it's pretty good. It's good enough for almost anybody. I tend to agree with that. Um, another big problem is it's fishable. 
you know, nothing's stopping you from entering an OTP code on a, on a phishing site. It just means that there's two steps instead of one to fish your account. Um, we said, already talked about app-based and, and the problems there. Like if you don't have a, a backup system or a recovery system, you're going to get locked out eventually. Push-based uh, 2FA has become more common. I think Duo might have been the first time that people experienced this experience. Uh, Twitter added support for it. Uh, Google has a lot of support for it as well. And it's, you know, it's it's kind of cool because there's no there's no secret stored anywhere really. It's it's just kind of like push-based interaction. There's there's cryptography involved. So it gets, you know, engineers really excited to work on this sort of stuff. Uh, but it still suffers from the same problem. If you don't have a backup story and you get a new phone, it could go away. And again, it's still fishable. There's nothing stopping you from pushing that button after you entered your password on a phishing site. Um, WebAuthn is the future, but unfortunately it's not ubiquitous. Uh, WebAuthn is, is kind of a a way to ensure that your credentials are origin bound so they can't be used on a phishing site technically, unless there's like a bug in the implementation. Um, but asking people to buy security keys isn't really scaling. I think we, we've seen that over the past like five years or so. Like even if you offered U2F or, or FIDO or WebAuthn, they're all kind of the same thing. Um, I think GitHub published a number that was like 1% of their users have ever used one of those in their lives. So. Um, if, if we're hanging our hats on something that 1% people can use, that's terrible. But I do think that the feature is going to be much brighter. The, the concept of a user verifying platform authenticator is a very fancy way of saying face ID. Um, logging in with face ID everywhere is going to be very common or, or uh, Microsoft's uh, Windows Hello is, is another implementation of this. Google Android also has like a biometric based thing. Um, so lots of people have these phones, but not everyone. And I think as the years go on, um, you know, that'll become more and more common and lots of people carry their phone everywhere they go. Not very many people carry their security keys everywhere they go. Yeah. And I think to your point, it doesn't scale if you think about, you know, consumers from a business perspective, it's easy to hand out keys by keys for individuals. But if you think about a kid who's going to school or, you know, teachers or those type of things, it doesn't scale well, at least not right now. I don't know any kids that carry keys, but then again, <laughs> I don't know very many kids. So Without losing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. Yeah. And with the security keys, you know, it's, it's like some, some sites will actually require it, but like you need more than one because you're going to misplace one. And as long as you have that back, you'll be okay. Uh, so, and I think this is something that's often overlooked in, in the crowd that says just use 2FA to solve all your problems. Um, even at 15% enrollment for like GitHub, they would always talk about how it was always in their top three support tickets in terms of volume, in terms of time to resolution. When people get locked out of their accounts, they're saying, hey, like I want access to my account. And you say, well, that's exactly what an attacker or a former employer would say. Um, so you kind of have to make sure we know it's you. And that process is pretty hard. Um, you know, depending on, on your application, you, you might not have a very, you know, other options for credentials, but again, sticking to the GitHub example, you know, they have SSH keys, they have personal access tokens, they, they know what browsers you've logged in from before. So all these things can help, um, but, but, you know, it's still sort of heavyweight and there's always going to be sort of a manual component to some of it. Um, so, yeah, you know, when you incentivize or mandate 2FA for a website, you better make sure you're ready to handle the support load because it will go very, very high. Um, you know, even cases where... Like, for example, you had to enable 2FA mm -hmm. to enter an organization. Like, that mandate made things a lot more difficult because now we're forcing people to use 2FA who may, may or not be ready to use it. Um, you know, some people just can't. Some people just don't understand the concept. Some people enable it, not understanding that they're going to have to use it the next time they sign in. Um, there's just all sorts of problems. So pushing people towards 2FA is, is good, and I want to have more people use it. But just blindly saying everyone should use it is going to be a problem. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting call out because a lot of times from a business perspective, we're pushed to move people from passwords to MFA because of the you know password churn. Um, but you're calling out here that even when you do that move, there's still a cost to support. Yeah, it's it's pretty significant. Um, so so then you kind of say like, well, is the protection of the accounts that have 2FA worth more than the support load that is that is incurred by doing this? And I, don't, I think that's kind of really impossible to quantify, but I would say that, uh, yeah, the, the support load kind of outweighs the benefits of the protected accounts. And um, I hope that the rest of the content of this talk can help sway you in that direction. 
that you don't need to enable 2FA, that even without 2FA, you can make a very strongly protected account. Uh, this tweet was very fortunate. Uh, as you see, the, the timestamp there was a few days ago. So I'm re really glad I saw this when I did. Uh, I'm just going to read it out loud in case anyone isn't, in, isn't uh, watching. And if you're watching and you're listening to me read and you're like me, it's going to really mess up your brain. But um, I've unpopularly said it before, but I'll say it again. As security experts, we don't get to decide the UX that people want. UX is the user experience, you know, it's kind of what they go through in this whole process. When we fight the UX that people want from our ivory tower, we usually lose and in an unsafe solution results. Or we can just make the UX that people want as safe as possible. Uh, I, don't, I don't know Dion too well, but I know he's been around for, for quite a while. Um, and I know he's got some little nuggets of wisdom like this that uh, pop up from time to time. And I love that he can basically put my entire talk into 140 characters. So I guess it's more than 140 characters. Because we have to design for humans. Not, you know, we're not designing for security engineers. We're not designing for engineers. We're designing for humans. Um, you know, keeping in mind that we're going to go with this mindset of like, we're not going to dictate how things should be, but rather just make what they're doing better. Um, you know, the question becomes, is it an opt-in situation? Will people use it? Like 2FA is an opt-in situation. Will people use it? No. Um, if we start adding other security features, are people going to use it? Uh, well, no. Um, we found that if you start adding checkboxes for security, Maybe some people will click a couple of them. And if you start adding 100 checkboxes for security, you're going to be in a mess. Um, so, you know, if, if you understand what you think the UX users want and you listen to them along the way and you have the data to prove it, they don't need a choice. If, it, if you're doing the right thing, hopefully it won't annoy people enough. And it, now that you've taken the decision away from them, you're automatically going to make everyone more secure. Um, but again, you know, you have to listen, you have to be careful, and you cannot dictate from your ivory tower. Now, taking a, a slight detour from the context, content here, I want to introduce Steve. Steve is busy on the phone all day, and he doesn't have time to think about his account. This story is for illustration purposes only. I don't know that that person's name is Steve, but he'll be a character in the rest of this show. Uh, just quickly, I want to talk about targeted versus mass attacks, because we're only going to be focusing on one of these. Um, Here's the targeted attacks column. We're going to be focusing on mass account takeovers and how they differ here. Uh, targeted attacks, hard to detect. Mass accounts, set off alarms. Targeted attacks, hard to measure. Mass accounts, easily quantified and, and trended. Uh, attacks, uh, targeted attacks are measured on the value of the individual accounts that they take, whereas mass accounts are measured on the number of accounts they take. Value is irrelevant. Targeted attacks are hard slash impossible to stop. Mass account takeovers are not very sophisticated. Target attacks, exciting, cutting edge, cyber, blinking lights, mass account takeovers, big snoring sound, not very sexy. Uh, target attacks is where we tend to focus our efforts and thinkings and what's in the news and what's in the hypothetical, what could happen. And mass account takeovers are where we more or less hope people do the right thing. So let's stop hoping people do the right thing and again, just do the right thing for them. I have a question. So when we talk about targeted attacks versus mass account takeovers, have you ever received like one of those emails that said your mom, they have your mom and they want like $10,000 to give her back? Like, is that an example of a mass account takeover attack or what is that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like a, a phishing campaign or, or um, credential stuffing, for example, or a targeted attack would be like, yeah, some nation state wants your data individually. So you can't really stop that. It's only a matter of time, I think. But um, but yeah, the mass account takeovers are a little bit more socially understood and, and can be controlled a little bit more with the technical controls that people are familiar with. And so, you know, just to kind of sum it up, uh, we want to automatically secure all their accounts with the right amount of friction. Um, friction is, I think, a, a good term to use here because you don't want to actually stop people from doing things. You want to maybe slow them down when something might be suspicious. Um, but keeping people out of their accounts um, isn't great. So now that we know 2FA is not the answer, like what is the answer? And I think this is a nice time to, to stop for questions or uh, there's an anecdote I can fill in. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort, I sort of love the uh, slide you had up earlier around, you know, 
like it's not our job. We can't dictate the interface. We can't dictate all these things. We can only suggest and sort of build a security model around what already exists. Um, I think that's just sort of the wisdom of InfoSec, right? It's our job to help enable like the answer to be secure rather than dictate the answer and say that this is secure. I'm not sure that's coming, that's landing super clear, but I, I, I sort of think that what you're highlighting here just represents our entire job in this industry. You know, we, you know, we have to figure out ways to not dictate, but sort of help and enable rather than dictate from an ivory tower. So, yeah, I, I think it's a it's a good, um, I don't know, piece of wisdom there that we should all remember. And it seems like there's going to need to be a lot of collaboration there because we have the security knowledge, right? And then we have other people who have that UX experience or what we think users will want. Um, and then we have that whole concept of what's default security. And so how do you marry all those different aspects of something um, to come out with something that's seamless <laughs> and still usable and still secure? <laughs> uh, iterations. Iterate and learn. Um, you know, there was a few times where we had to take a step back because we went too far. Um, and if we had just sort of plowed a forward, then that could have been even worse. And, um, you know, you definitely, again, not dictating from every tower. Like we worked very closely with the support teams. Everything we did, it was like, hey, like we, we noticed this pattern. We think we can sort of mitigate it by doing this. You know, what do you think that's going to do? And, and sometimes they would say like, oh, I think that's just going to raise the support load too high. And that was one of the forcing functions that told us like, okay, like this is the wrong thing. And, you know, we had to fully trust our support load that they weren't just saying like they don't want more work because they were always on board. They always wanted to secure the accounts, but they also had the best sense of like, what do you think will happen if? Um, and sure enough, there were some times they go, oh, yeah, no problem. And then we, then we see and we do. And they're like, okay, let's roll that back a little bit. Uh, it's not a perfect science, but, you know, just being willing to like adapt and learn and provide data to like prove assumptions um, can really go a long way to you know, making sure you're doing the right thing and always listen. <laughs> and how, how do you approach, like, I guess just the other side, like the threat model, or if you have a high risk kind of environment, you know, what would your recommendations or how would you approach this? Or how would, how would your approach change if you were in a more high risk environment? Uh, well, I guess high risk environment implies you can maybe discount the UX a little bit. Um, or you could increase the cost of support. Yeah. Which you know, isn't unlimited, but uh, just like a little example, um, we rolled out one of these features and just by coincidence, like half of the account team was on like uh, parental leave. And so they were short staffed and we had like rolled out a feature. And then, um, you know, it was so bad. They were like, we need to hire contractors to like keep up with this. Um, all the engineers on like the security team like started doing frontline triage so we could like handle this sort of stuff, um, which is again, a great way to listen to things. But, you know, we knew it couldn't sustain like that. And we were forced to sort of make some concessions. But, you know, every time we made a concession, we always, you know, made sure that we're not giving up on security. And uh, every concession we made, maybe we only need to make a half a concession to make it good for everyone. Um, again, just data, listening, learning, and pushing where you can and applying the right amount of friction where you can. You know, for like Twitter, for example, was so anti-captcha. Like no matter what you did, they would never have a captcha on a website. And it was just like, like, you know, they wanted accounts, they wanted tweets, they didn't want to put anything in anyone's way. And like, as a result, like, you know, they had some issues with automated accounts and things like that. So sometimes you don't get the choice because the product demands it and you can only fight so hard. Or sometimes the security need is so high that you can sort of skip some of these things. But yeah, it just, just depends. Yeah. Do, do you think in that consumer environment, you know, non-corporate or enterprise where you have that control over the user, do you think the problem is services not always offering MFA or the problem is the MFA that they do offer is, is totally unusable for the average user? Uh, I would just say that fundamentally 2FA is a problem for the average user right now. Um, okay. But yeah, again, in the corporate environment, anyone can use 2FA because all you got to do is email your sysadmin. To, to reset that. Yeah, sure, um, totally. And, and Neil, is there a particular reason why you're calling it calling out 2FA versus MFA? Um, and I'm just harping or picking on this because I heard Nikki say MFA, and then you said 2FA. Um, so 
any any differences there as to why you're focused on 2FA? So that is a great question. Uh, I only say 2FA because it's like a habit and I can't stop saying it. Uh, I do think MFA is the more accurate approach here because sometimes it's not just two steps. Sometimes it's like one and a half steps. Sometimes like it can be one to two steps depending um, or, or three. So MFA is definitely the, the more accurate number. I, maybe one day I can stop saying 2FA. <laughs> All right, so what do we do? We're, we're at this place where we're like, all right, MFA is not very usable. We got to come up with some other solutions here to secure user accounts. What, what, what do we do? So uh, the first thing I would start with is having an audit log for your application. Um, an audit log is just kind of like a, a, a list of events that happened, maybe with some metadata. Uh, it does not include sort of you know everything, but it's supposed to be uh, comprehensive enough to sort of give you a good story. So. The most important thing is that they're read only. If your audit logs are mutable, then what is the point of them? If the data can just change, they are not a, a record of history, but a guess of what could have possibly happened. Um, so making these things read only is incredibly important. The event happens and the data around it doesn't change. You can enrich more data, but the, the core fundamental data can't change. Uh, you want things to be reasonably comprehensive. So not every click on a page is important, but the important events are pretty obvious. Um, you know, and you also want to make sure they're very thorough. It has to include enough information to actually recreate the event itself. You can't just say a thing happened. It probably needs some context around like what was happening when that happened. Um, so there will be hundreds of events. Uh, you know, pr pretty much when every new feature would be util being built, it would be like one of the considerations is you know what are your success metrics, what is your audit log going to include, and you know among other things. Uh, so it's just kind of the habit of doing these things, and you know. This isn't just useful for security, it's useful for debugging, it's useful for the support team, it's useful for incident response. If you can now create series of events based on an audit log, that saves you a lot of time going around digging through other logs, trying to like correlate all this data and try to create a story. So, you know, audit log events could include like enable this feature, created this page, uh, changed their password, uh, you know, added an email address to the account. All these things sort of have different uses in different contexts but they're going to be valuable to anyone trying to understand what's going on in the account. A uh, natural sort of progression from audit logs is taking some of those very important events and turning them into some sort of notification system. You know, email is probably the, the most simple way to do this. Uh, if you have sort of a, an in-app notification system, that would also probably be a good way to do this. Uh, not necessarily saying you should send a push message to everyone's phone, but maybe certain events do kind of demand that. So for your notifications, you want these things to be high confidence. You know, if, if there's a chance that this is a false positive, uh, you, you send someone a false positive and they're going to mark you a spam. That's, that's what you want to avoid. You want to make these notifications very terse. So use fewer words. Get to the point. Use consistent language. Use language that is well understood across international boundaries, especially if you're in an English-only environment. Um, because you don't want these things to be, to be confusing. You don't want to include a bunch of irrelevant information. Um, you probably want to link off to some documentation so people can read more or just to, you know, tell them where they can reach out for more information. But that's all. Uh, text versus HTML emails, I think, is kind of up for debate. I tend to prefer text emails, but I do think I am slowly losing that war. Um, the other thing is these emails need to be consistent, well-designed, not only the language, but the formatting of them, where they come from. You know, phishing emails will try to emulate this. And... Most fall pretty short. There's usually a typo or something. Um, so make sure your emails don't have typos. Uh, if people start thinking your emails are phishing, they will also go to spam. Yeah, totally. Cool. So quite back to this, two questions on this. I mean, I think Facebook does a, communicates with you on facebookmail.com, which is a non-standard Facebook. Well, I mean, it's their domain, but it requires that little extra search of like, is facebookmail.com actually Facebook or is it a phishing site? It's a little weird. Um, but back to uh, notifications around suspicious activity. Let's just say you're an organization. H how do you know what suspicious activity is? We talked about logs and enabling audit logs, but what is like the journey there of saying good suspicious? Like, is there, how do you do that? Or how do you even begin to do that? Uh, well, certainly it feels awfully su uh, subjective, but you kind of, I think, yeah, yeah, look over your audit log events and just kind of bucket them between, you know, dangerous or not dangerous, and then what does dangerous mean? Um, I think dangerous in this context would be sort of anything that changes the access to an account. So 
if your email address changes, if an SSH key is added, uh, or if like an access token is added, or if the OAuth application is authorized, you know, anything that can either be used to access your GitHub account or use your GitHub account somewhere else is probably a signal that you should be notified. Um, so yeah, right. I, I don't want to say it's obvious, but using that criteria of like, will this change the level of access to my account is a pretty good starting point. Um, but, and then, so once you have that list, then go through it a second time and then go, is this really important? Because um, again, you want to keep that, that list pretty short. Well, the notifications aren't just limited to email, right? Like you also get SMS notifications and like now they're weird looking spammy SMS ones too. Like for instance, Chase Bank sends me alerts on SMS. So I guess like how can people distinguish what is a legitimate SMS versus like a fake one? Uh, I mean, short codes kind of help, but I don't understand why they haven't completely taken over. Um, like. Twitter's been using short codes for like 10 years. And as far as I know, they haven't really had too bad of a phishing problem. Um, this, this, isn't, this is probably a little bit too edge casey here, but um, you can actually format the SMS messages in a way that like Apple, for example, will automatically fill them in the web browser so that they're like origin bound, for example. I think that's a really cool technology, but that doesn't really necessarily stop phishing in a sense that if you're like not using Safari when you got that text message, I don't think you get the protection. Um, but anything that's kind of like origin bound there will help. Um, but yeah, and then so in addition to SMS, I kind of talked about like like push messages are also an option. If your application has like in in application notifications, that's a pretty good place to put them too because some people just won't read their emails or they've already marked you as spam. Um, so just just another way to get them in front of their face without you know uh, interrupting their day is always going to be helpful. So let's get back to our friend Steve here. Uh, as you probably guessed, Steve does not have good password policy practices. He uses his college email on every site. He gets weekly emails from Have I Been Pwned, so he marked them as spam. Uh, Steve just saw an email that said his password was reset, and he replied with, no, my password is dolphin. <laughs> um, so we want to improve password quality. And the first place not to start is your password policy. Uh, I yeah. think. You know, this has been a joke for like 20 years. There's a whole website devoted to bad password policies. The one on the right here is probably one of my favorites. I, I kind of don't believe it's actually real because this is exactly what I would put if I was trying to make fun of password policies. Um, so we all know that they're terrible. Forced password resets or, or forced password changes periodically have also been proven to be kind of pointless or harmful, depending on how you look at it. Um, people just add one, two, whatever. Uh, so instead of, of trying to make their passwords better, how about we just ban passwords we know are bad? Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, but before you do any of this, uh, make sure your recovery story is good. If you're going to start banning passwords, make sure that people are able to get back into their account. Uh, like I've already said, not being able to access your account legitimately is one of the worst feelings in the world in terms of online accounts. Um, and this is often overlooked, and it's one of the most important things about recovery is Requiring that your emails are validated is a very powerful feature. Um, knowing that the email address actually exists and is owned by the same person is a very good way to make sure that they don't lose access to their account. Yay, we banned half a billion passwords. Like, what, if, what about the half a billion and one? Like, whoop de doo Like, you, you just, you know, <laughs> it actually worked out really well. So we would have this data and we would see, like, you know, are people using the passwords and have I been pwned? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, it was incredibly painful just to watch, you know, thousands of people log in a day with, with a password that is in this public data set. And while this password in a public data set does not include the identity or the, the email address or the account name, guess what attackers are trying against accounts? Things like that. Um, so what we decided to do, if we detected they're using a compromise, a weak password, um, we would put a large dismiss non-dismissable red banner across the top of the page and said, you need to change your password. Um, new accounts, for example, couldn't be created with the password in this data set. You can't change your password to a password in this data set. But if your password is in the data set, you can continue to use it for a little while. Um, it was kind of interesting because we, we kind of went back and forth in this a lot. Like people aren't going to necessarily notice their emails. So how are we going to get it in front of them? We didn't have an in-app notification system we could use. And we kind of had a pattern where we put dismissible banners across the top of the page for things. 
but we didn't want people to dismiss this banner. Um, you know, it, it's so easy for someone to say like, oh, your, your password is bad. Please change it. And they go, okay, buddy, I'll do that. Sure. Um, Cause they don't. So a big red dismiss non-dismissible banner worked. Um, you know, it was one of the cases where we had to iterate on the language probably like 10 times because it was really hard to convey this message that, you know, your password is in a public data set. We're not going to allow you to use it in the future. Please change it. Um, is a very hard thing to convey. And, you know, this is primarily called a credential stuffing attack. Um, have I been pwned is, is sourced from other third party breaches that uh, Troy Hunt has, you know, combined to one sort of anonymous data set. But the data sets that Troy got a hold of are the same data sets that the sort of malicious people are getting a hold of and trying against your website. And just so to, to clearly define credential stuffing, um, people don't use unique passwords across websites. They're supposed to, they don't. I'm guilty of it too. Um, whenever a third party site gets hacked uh, and they're able to reverse the passwords, attackers will take that information and try it on every site in the world because it's probably gonna work on a few of them. Um, hopefully it's not your bank account, hopefully it's not your email account, um, but password reuse is common and we would see so many uh, spikes in, in logins with people with these passwords and it's like, well, uh, correlation is not causation, but I'm pretty confident that's what's going on here. You literally gave away so my e password, which is dolphin, to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> So now I have to make it dolphin one two zero and then another number. Oh, look at that! Adding four characters, you just doubled the strength of that password. <laughs> yeah, you need that special character in there too. <laughs> yeah, always gotta have that. Yeah, so I, I was just gonna ask. So we're at this place where we don't want to require this like arcane set of requirements here. It has to be eight characters. Know this, know that. We know they're reusing passwords. You know, it's a coming off a word list or public dump. What What do you do then? Like, how did you incentivize the right behavior there? Once you had this like non dismissible banner, did you give them a form field that was like, here are suggested good passwords, or did you leave that up to them? What did you do? Um, we decided the only thing that we would promote is the use of a password manager. So we would tell people if you're using a password manager to randomly generate a password unique to this website that you will never run into this problem again. And as long as your password is sufficiently strong and most password generators do generate sufficiently strong passwords by default, um, you know, if, you're, if your random account gets hacked on this site, there's no chance it'll be hacked on this site. And um, interestingly enough, while your password might end up and have I been pwned, if it is pwned in the future, even though it's a strong password, if you generate another one, the chances it's gonna match something in that data set is basically zero. Um, so we banned a lot of bad passwords, but we did not ban very many passwords generated by a password manager. And even if they were, again, randomness says it won't occur on another site. Did you just know? How did you know they were using a password manager? You just like sort of verbally or in the message bar tried to incentivize them to do that. There was no other technical way of, I guess it's crazy. How would you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I did. I did want to try something where like, um, you know, if someone's typing their password, there's going to be a lot of key down and key up events, or maybe right, there's right. A, a copy paste event. And so if you're able to fill in your password super quick, you're probably not typing it, right. but I don't, it, yeah. it didn't really feel like a, a super accurate way. And it would probably be false positive positive prone and some random password manager is going to do something funky to like make that not work. We never actually tried it, but it was kind of, instead, you just really fo focused on the social aspect. You know, the message said, use these password managers, just like the 2FA, we were very opinionated on what people should use. Um, and same thing in our documentation, we just really hammered home it. If you're using a password manager, you will not have this problem. And by the way, here's all the other benefits for using a password manager. Um, so it just kind of really, it's kind of like a cultural, like push in one direction, we're gonna be very opinionated, use these things. And if you do, you will be good, not, here are the benefits of password manager. Here's how they're generated. Here's how the keys are stored. You know, none of that, none of that, just the, the social aspect of it. Sure, yeah. Well, how do you know that the password manager is safe? That's one question. And then the second thing is, let's say I generated an automatic, I don't know, password on my MacBook, but my phone is an Android. And now I have to remember this like 20 key something, something password. Like, yeah, how does that work? What do you suggest there? Uh, so I think the primary criteria is that it can be accessed from multiple devices. Um, you know, we did kind of take the, the reputation and kind of, I don't know, like uh, 
we kind of took their word for the security posture to some sense. So we wouldn't recommend just like some random password manager, but um, we also didn't want to recommend something that would be too complicated for the average person. You know, there's plenty of ways you can store your passwords locally and in a local vault and you can manage that and you can share it across your devices, but that's not even going to work for me. Like I use one password. I'm fine with that. Um, it's a great tool. It's across all platforms. Um, it's not the only one of its kind, but it's, it's a pretty darn good one. Uh, but the primary criteria is, yeah, being able to recover all your passwords in a safe way and then being able to access them on multiple devices, um, which works great, but there's no one password for like Nintendo Switch, for example. So your phone, your laptop, probably okay, but your Amazon Alexa show does not have a password manager either. And when that thing forgets its password, I get really annoyed. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Alexa heard manager. that. <laughs> I always talk trash. Um, okay, yeah. So, uh, I guess anything else on that? I'm going to kind of dig into like the how it works. Yeah, keep going. Um, so, basically, we just take all the passwords from Have I Been Pwned. They're stored in SHA 1 format. We just jam them right into our database um, and then we just do a lookup. Now, you can call their API, and I would say there's no security implications of doing so. It's, an, it's a password without a username, so it's, it's, it's OK to send. But if you don't want to rely on a third-party service, um, I definitely suggest you download the data, plop it in a database, and then it's a simple uh, select statement query there. But you know, a lot of people go like, how do you know what my password is? Like, what do you, are you sending my, like, is a third party telling you my password is bad? Are you sending my, my password across to some website? Are you sharing my account? Are you hacking my account? Are you storing your passwords in clear text was another thing we got a lot. Um, no, we are not. We only use a password when you give it to us. And when do you give us a password? When you sign in, uh, when you created your account, when you changed your password during a, a sort of pseudo prompt where they ask you to sort of re-authenticate an authenticated session, when you make an API call with the password, when you're using subversion with the password. Um, these are all times you give us your password and we can sort of mark your account as you know having used a compromised password. Um, it's there's there's you know like again we're not sorting your password in plain text we're not doing some sort of complicated crypto it's just every time you give it to us we check if it's in that database um, and there's sort of a, a database schema here on the right it's possibly a little more complicated than it needs to be but it is kind of hinting that um, have I been pwned shouldn't be your own data source so Steve isn't happy um, we put a big red banner on his page we call his password bad. Uh, we've interrupted his days, and his coworkers saw the big red banner and shamed him over it. So Steve decided to change his password. As I alluded to, um, don't stop at Have I Been Pwned. There's lots of data sets out there. There's there's one called Crack Station. There's I can't remember. There's, there's a bunch of other ones, and you know even just straight up dictionaries help. Uh, there's also third party sites that claim to have the same data feeds that the attackers have that they will sell to you as well. Uh, and they're pretty accurate. I'm not going to lie. Uh, almost to the point where, like, I wonder if they're just creating these accounts and then just giving us the passwords of the accounts they created because they are scary accurate. Um, so I, I, I really suggest you go beyond to have it pwned. Now, if you're adding new passwords, what could go wrong, right? Well, when we first rolled out our initial data set, you know, we didn't force anyone to change their passwords. They just put a big red dismissible banner. Uh, but eventually, you're going to want to force people to change their password. So give them a 30-day countdown, for example. Now, what happens if you ingest a new da password data source, and my password that was considered OK yesterday is now considered leaked? Are you going to lock me out right away? No, again, you need that 30-day window. Because if I show up to work tomorrow, and I'm on call, and there's an incident, and I have to reset my password because like a complete surprise, that would be really, really annoying. So the 30-day window is great. You know, you can store a timestamp along with the user that says when the password was discovered, encrypt that so the lack of a value does not indicate, you know, that the account doesn't have a compromised password. Um, and then just sort of as that 30 day window comes, the next time they try to sign in, force them to go through a password reset. It's a pretty good flow and we did not get very many complaints from this as far as I know. And yeah, um, like I said, I, the compromised password stuff, I think it's really undervalued in the industry. Um, even starting with Have I Been Pwned is a huge improvement, but going a little bit further uh, can really go a long way. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit more later on and how kind of I know this worked, but 
with enough data, you can see that a suspicious login is coming from a compromised password as a pretty strong signal that uh, that account is in trouble. And you mentioned other sources to look for compromised passwords. Can you just dig into that a little bit more? Do you know like the sources, like I guess, you know, a lot of the browser password managers, you know, do this now. Do they all API to have I've or are there like other lists out there that are consumable? Um, I would be shocked if, if people were going to be relying on an API like that. So I'm pretty sure they're also ingesting these things. Um, I don't know where, for example, Google gets their, their data source from, but um, the more sources, the better. I don't want to list off any like private companies because they're all sure. know, people who sell this information. But, you know, Googling around, you'll, you'll find a couple. Um, and I, I strongly suggest you look into those. Um, they aren't free, but they are very valuable. A strong and, uh, indicator that your Hulu account may have been hacked is when you sign in and there's a random profile for Rob. And you're like, who's that? <laughs> well, Hulu yeah. should have sent you a suspicious message, though, <laughs> long before. I don't think, I don't want to bash on them, but I don't think that they sent me anything, which is the other uh, thing I was going to ask. Like, what happens when you don't get that message? Like, uh, you know, when these notifications get dropped or I guess, like, can we just count on email as a reliable um, source for something that may not have an in-app, like, notification service or push notification? Like, how do you tell people? Yeah, I would say that maybe 5% of emails are seen and acted upon. Um, that's actually, you know, that's probably not fair, but... There have been times where uh, the success of something solely depended on emails, and that did not work out. Um, I can, I'll talk about the specific example later in the talk, but uh, it's a really hard thing, but you, sh you have to do at least emails. Um, you know, the, the banner in the application was something because we knew we, we needed 100% coverage on this. Um, and the eventual forced password reset kind of solved the case of like they never saw the banner or the email. Um, but it did take us a while to get to that point. So I'm a bit curious I about this banner. I'm sorry, go ahead, sorry, Nikki. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I'm curious about the banner that they can't dismiss. And did you get any support cases around that? Like people who were angry that they couldn't finish their work because they had to address this banner? Uh, so as, as a lot of people might understand, when you have an anonymous support inbox, uh, people aren't very nice to it. Uh, you know, this was another one of those cases where the engineers are kind of on the front lines of the support, triaging the tickets, you know, seeing what people are saying. Profanity, racism, like any any bad thing you could think of was included in that support inbox, which doesn't really surprise me. But the level at which people will go to, like, defend their bad password was pretty ridiculous. Um, and that's kind of why I said the language was so important. It had to be two to three sentences, it had to convey exactly what had happened, it had to have no ambiguities, it had to answer every question, um, and it was really, really hard. Um, lots of people are like, screw you, my password's good enough, I want to continue using it, and we're just like, well, okay, uh, you're eventually going to get in trouble, and so we kind of had to stop kind of listening to that voice, and we had lots of people just straight up didn't believe us, they're like, Dolphin 12 is a really strong password, mm -hmm. it's way stronger than Dolphin 1. Um, and that was the other thing. People would email us their passwords too. Uh, and this was not uncommon. So like with technical user base, right? Um, that doesn't really work out too well. So it, it was definitely a good source to sort of learn like what we did wrong. Again, like the implications that people sort of inferred from what we were saying were like wildly off from what we were doing. So we had to keep iterating on that language. Uh, and I think eventually it got to a point where, you know, enough people had experienced it that they weren't surprised by it. And then the language was clear enough that people could go on it or at least read more documentation, but people were very unhappy. And this was one of those cases where we could have maybe acquiesced. We could have added an opt-out box, for example, but we decided to stick to no opt-out. Everyone has the same experience. Please change your password. So in your experience, in, in the model that you've constructed there, <clears throat> when accounts did get taken over, what was, how did, how did that unfold? Or what was the common, what did you observe during actual account takeovers? 
mostly credential stuffing. Um, so from the bad passwords, the dolphin one, two style type credential stuffing. Yeah, well, and then also again, like uh, malicious people get attack, get a hold of third party breach data, and then they just try sure. that directly. Um, but yeah, the number of like times people got fished, or the number of times like I don't know, you, it's really impossible to tell whether it's malware. Um, but you know, people would let yeah. us know like, yeah, I totally entered my password on this third party site. Like, I got fished. I know it. Some people didn't know it, but when people's accounts start doing things and they start receiving notifications in their inbox about email address is changing, uh, they would write into support and go like, what's going on here? Um, and support would always say, reset your password. <laughs> <clears throat> and yeah, sometimes there was like themes to like, it, it would come in waves occasionally. And that's kind of when we're thinking like, oh, like there must be a new phishing site or something, or yeah. must be or something big going dump. around. Yeah, or some big, yeah. More likely it was always a big dump. Um, yeah. And you can you could even see it in the data. Um, like I don't know if these were different actors, but like the pattern was like almost exactly the same as if they were trying the same email addresses and same passwords in the same order, because the graphs would look the same. It's like, oh, there's a bunch of passwords that were in have I been pwned that went up. Oh, look, it happened again. Like it's two different people testing the same data set or something. Um it was, it was uh I don't know if fun is the right word, but it was interesting to watch. So there's a comment in the chat that honeypots from D Barkwell that honeypots are a great way to discover potentially leaked passwords. Have you did you use any honeypots in your in the environment that you built there to help improve your data set? Uh, no, not really. Um, the third party data sets were pretty good, and they're probably doing something similar as well. Um, but yeah, yeah. If, if you put a form on the internet, people are going to enter data. That's that's for sure. <laughs> Good, good question there. Um, so this is, I think, where things get really interesting. Um, you know, interesting in the context of a, of a boring uh, scenario, but um, this is where kind of we did the audit logs, we did the notifications, we forced people to have better passwords, and that was kind of good. Um, but it wasn't the best insight onto all the malicious activity on their account. So before we could do anything, we had to understand what was happening. You know, I mentioned that we would have graphs that would show that people are using passwords from have I been pwned. Um, you know, what is happening during a login? What is happening during, you know, all these other events? So uh, this was kind of loosely based on a system that was developed at Twitter where you kind of track the sign-ins over time and, and sort of build a model of what's normal account activity. Hint, you don't need machine learning or AI to do this, just a database. Um, and then just sort of act, act upon anomalous behavior. You know, we didn't really know what that meant at the time, but we knew we needed to sort of start collecting data. So this is a very slimmed down version of the tables you will need to sort of track this data. Um, just kind of explaining the schema a little bit. We have the user sessions table uh, that represents, you know, your, your session when you're logged in, it's backed by a database. Uh, then we have what we call authentication records. The naming on this stuff is, is questionable, but this is how I know it. So it feels more, most comfortable to talk about it. So user session can have, you know, one or more authentication records. An authentication record is just sort of a, uh, a record of something happening related to, uh, you know, authenticated activity. Um, and it sort of also has an authenticated device. An authenticated device is just a representation of kind of like your, your device ID cookie on a browser. So it represents like that browser instance. So yes, you could delete the cookie. Yes, you could use incognito. Didn't really matter, but tracking that information along with your authentication records was really useful for uh, a, a later section here. So every time someone signs in, create an authentication record and an authenticated device. Now, you can sign out and sign in on the same device multiple times. So it's the same authenticated device, but multiple user sessions and multiple authentication records. But every sign in will have an authenticated device associated with it. And then the second piece to this, which is incredibly important, is every time someone changes an IP address, create a new authentication record. So it's not an authentication record of their sign in event. It's a record that they were somewhere else with an active session. Uh, and if that active session was you know, good, then we can assume that the later activity is. Now, their cookies could have been stolen. Their, again, malware could have done all these things. These are not the use cases we're considering here. We're talking about the normal case. Uh, so that's, that's step one. Step two, um, you, you can't really build a model if you don't have enough data. And you can't really build a model if you have noisy clients kind of 
outliers kind of throwing everything off. Uh, so, you know, if you, you need to find a way to filter the noise. You know, some, some people will sign in thousands of times a day and some people will visit thousands of IP addresses in a session. These people skew, skew your data way off and need to be excluded. Um, that part can be a little bit annoying uh, and kind of really depends on your traffic patterns, but it's incredibly important to know that the data you're basing your decisions off of is at least good enough. Um, from this data, create your, your dashboards and alerts, you know, take a look at the spikes, seeing what information you can, you know, glean from that. And then step three is where you cry. Um, you see a massive spike in activity, wonder if it's really bad, and then you realize it is. Um, you know, before we really did anything and we just had data, it's just so like disheartening to just look at a graph and not necessarily know that an attack is underway, but have a pretty good feeling that an attack is under the way and just you can't do anything about it. Um, you know, again, I'll, I'll sort of explain why I, I realize I believe this data is good enough to go off of later. Um, but it was kind of an eye opener. Not only did we know that people's accounts were getting taken over and they were writing in, but there was a lot of people who didn't write in about it that were getting their accounts taken over as well. And sometimes these were throwaway accounts. Sometimes they were high value accounts. Um, it, we didn't really know. So Steve got an email saying that he signed in from Argentina. Um, but, you know, we, we determined this by looking at all the data we had in the authentication records. And based on the current IP address, does it belong to a country that Steve has signed in from before? So Steve's never been to Argentina, but someone tried to sign in. And so we used that data to send him a notification to let him know about it. Nothing against Argentina, random selection, had to choose something. Um, so the authentication records will have a record of IP addresses and country codes. And then you can just do a simple lookup. Um, but before we, we go into the actual SQL here, I just want to say like GOIP lookups are not GPS data. So you can't opt out of GOIP lookups. You, you have to have an IP address for a request. Um, these GOIP lookups are performed by private companies, collect sort of metadata about an IP address and, and potential location information. It is not 100% accurate. It cannot be used to pinpoint anyone's location, but it is good enough for our purposes. Um, you know, like I said, we're talking about country codes here. So going back to our table, um, we need to make sure that we have an index on this column because since this is done in line in the sign-in process, it has to be very fast. Uh, so creating an index on the user ID and the country code allows you to create this query on the bottom, select one from authentication records where user ID equals placeholder and country code equals placeholder. Now notice we're storing the country code in the database even though we could look that up by the IP address. But looking up IP addresses and converting it to a geolocation is not going to work out. So if we store the country code, it's a very simple query like this. Now, um, I'm not a database expert, but I do feel confident in saying that this query is essentially free. Uh, select one means I don't actually care about the data. Just give me a Boolean of whether it exists. Um, and then our where clause, we have user ID and country code that are covered by the index above. So the lookup will only exist in the index. And since we don't care about any data, it'll never actually hit the database. It'll just do everything in the index. And then because we put the limit one there, we're not actually scanning the whole table. We just give up as soon as we find any match. So this query will tell you exactly whether or not this user has been in this country code based on the data you have, and it's essentially free. Uh, free queries are the best queries. But... Uh, I kind of debated if I want to take this slide out because the stuff that's going on in the world is actually a perfect demonstration of why borders are not the best measure of suspicion. Uh, there isn't a single map that the entire world would agree on, but again, uh, we're not looking for, for precise and highly accurate or um, politically uh, agreeable situations. We're just trying to put some sort of boundary on where people may or may not travel. Um, some people never leave the borders of their country some people cross multiple on the ways to work. So you need to sort of think about both of these use cases. I think there's another piece of using VPN and browsers like Tor as well um, to consider here too. Yeah. Um, in our experience, like that, that does happen, but those people are kind of used to the extra friction involved. Mm. Um, so if you sign in from all 200 countries, you'll never get an or, 200 plus countries, you'll never get an alert about it. And, you know, maybe you're okay with that threat model because you're, you know how to use a VPN and uh, maybe you're, you're, like you said, using Tor and you're, you're always incognito and that's fine. 
but those people already kind of accept the extra friction that comes with their their usage patterns. Yeah, they made the, maybe those fringe cases that you talked about. So. Yeah, um, and again, because I I don't think that's super common, it it wasn't really worth uh, considering for this, but it was something we at least talked about and kind of knew that yeah, someone who visits all the countries loses this protection, but that's going to be pretty rare. Um, most people, I, I don't I don't want to. I'll just make up the data, but it was most people never visit more than like five countries. Um, and that's pretty good considering how many there are. And we talked about maybe going like a little bit more precise, like region and things like that. But with the, the imprecise data, it is going to be too false positive. Um, but yeah, um, so I talked about the, the border case, right? Like if you're going to Europe, if you're in Europe and you cross three borders on your way to work and you do that every day and you just happen to sign in from you know, the border that's in the middle on your way to work and you get an alert, you're like, I come here every day and you're warning me about a sign-in that happened, like this isn't very useful. Um, so we wanna make sure we don't spam people uh, with, with unnecessary alerts. And this information has actually always been available on the website, but no one ever seemed to care that it was not super accurate. But as soon as you turn on notifications and you start getting false positives, people care. Um, but the rate of false positives here was pretty low. And it was always like someone like, yeah, like. I logged in for Portugal and you said it was from Spain and like they live like right on the border. Like those things sort of happen. Um, but the the true positive rate was high enough that the false positive rate didn't really bother us. And people really reacted on these emails. You know, they, they, when, when you see your account has logged in from a country you've never been to, that's a pretty good sign you should act upon it. Um, yeah, any, any questions on that data model? We did go over it very quickly. I don't, I, I like to say it's easy, but if it doesn't seem easy, that's a problem with the delivery and not the implementation in my opinion. So um, definitely would, would entertain all questions here as well. What about the device? <clears throat> that seems like pretty good signal, new device. It did is a very that good in, Was that in the model as well? I mean, I saw it on the screenshot. Yeah, that's, uh, I believe that's the next upcoming section. We're going to oh, talk sorry. about that, but you're right. It is incredibly useful. Um, you know, All right, I want to jump the gun. We could uh, <laughs> sideline that for a minute. Oh, fair enough, fair enough. Um, yeah, the, like I said, the notification is really helpful. Um, the, the system at Twitter was a little bit differently or worked a little bit differently. Um, we're doing sort of live lookups based on your historical data. But Twitter was kind of an order of magnitude of scale above that. So maybe that wasn't really practical to them. So instead of doing a live lookup, they would basically just have a job that run every 24 hours. It would look over the last six months of your activity. It would generate the list of countries you visited. And then we just look up against that list directly. And I don't know that that's still how it's done. I think it was done that way mostly out of like out of limitations where you're taking like one form of data and trying to stick it into another and then try to use it but it also meant that it could scale very well. And really the only downside of it is that it was up to 24 hours stale. You know, our information was always up to date, but like most people don't sign in twice a day from a country they've never visited. So uh, the number of people who would have been impacted by those false positives is pretty low and something they just accepted. Um, I thought about going that route as well, but um, it just seemed a lot easier just to plop something in a database rather than have to do some big data query, transfer the data, populate it somewhere else, and then query it. Makes sense. There's a comment in the chat from QZQN. I like these steps. I think people are appreciating that. You're really explaining the whole entire approach here down to how you're building the data model. So yeah, it's great. Yeah, I, I certainly feel like a talk like this can can lose a lot of value if you speak in abstracts, but um, you know, a, providing the direct data model and the actual SQL queries down to the indexes, hopefully is enough to, to get people to build off on it, off of it. Cool, I think that is um, all in the chat. So we plow ahead. Great, so speaking of devices, um, this is where that, that portion comes in. Uh, we have the data. We've been tracking it with with sign-ins, but um, you know the, the data is a little bit different. Uh, we can build a similar model, but notifications for unrecognized devices would be pretty noisy. 
Um, the number of signings that came in from an unrecognized country were about 10%, I believe. And the number of unrecognized devices, so they cleared their cookies, new browser, incognito, whatever, was like somewhere around 40%. So if 40% of sign-ins generated an email that mostly would be false positive E, uh, we didn't find a whole lot of value in that. Um, now, uh, not only was this useful to sort of you know make si decisions about sign-ins, but it was also very useful for forensics. Again, you can delete your cookie, you can change your cookie, but guess what? Most attackers don't. So they would just leave a, 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 a trail of breadcrumbs and using that same cookie across you know multiple things, uh, and it was very very useful. What is IR? Uh, sorry, IR is incident response. I see. Okay. So uh, when, whenever something would happen, um, we kind of through things like the audit log and things like request logs, trying to recreate what had happened in an event. Having that cookie to correlate re requests is pretty powerful. So back to Steve. Um, someone tried to sign into his account, but it was from the United States, so he did not get an email. Um, but because the attempt came from an unknown device, the attacker had to solve an email-based challenge. Luckily, Steve's email password wasn't the same as his S SVN hub password anymore because he changed it. Um, so yeah, th this system is uh, you know, fa fairly straightforward where um, you, know, you, you store a challenge code either on the client encrypted or on a backend somewhere. You email that code to them. They then enter the code on the page. This is a flow that I would dare say most people are familiar with to some degree. Maybe it's not a code, maybe it's a link you click. Um, but either way, this is, is something that everyone can sort of understand. And uh, people didn't necessarily have a problem with the way it worked. They just kind of had a problem with the way it existed. Um, this is now extra friction that we were adding to people. Um, I think there, there is a question about, like I mentioned, you can store it in an encrypted cookie or a database. Um, there, there's kind of benefits and drawbacks to both approaches. So storing it encrypted in a cookie, I think might make some people kind of like shiver, like you should never store data. Like what if you encrypt it wrong? What if it can be decrypted? Uh, if that were the case, then Rails would be completely broken. So I don't think that's the case. And if it is, well, uh, there's not much we can do about that for now. Uh, so that's also helpful because it binds the challenge to the client. So that code only works on that browser which is secure, but it's also a huge pain in the butt. Um, let's say you're on your mobile phone and you get an email and you click that on your, your Gmail client and then it opens up in a little web view and says, okay, sign in. Okay, now we just emailed you a, a challenge. So go back to your email client, copy that code. It's like, okay, well, I guess I close the window, copy the code, go back, click that link again. Okay, it's asking me for my password again. Let me enter that. Okay, now it's entering, asking me for a code, so I'll enter the code I copied before. Nope, sorry, that doesn't work. This is all part of a new challenge. That code is for the old challenge. When you close the window, you lost your cookies. And that is a frustrating experience, and it is totally understandable. Um, so, you know, I would kind of encourage the, the other approach of just, like, the code doesn't change per browser. Maybe it stays the same for 10 minutes. Maybe it's stored on the database somewhere. Um, but if it's stored in a cookie and you lose it, that's not the best experience. So why such a drastic measure? Um, did we just shout from our ivory tower? Why notifications for one, but extra hurdles for the other? Uh, <laughs> this was probably the single biggest event in terms of raising uh, the number of support tickets. If you thought 15% of users with 2FA was bad, imagine 85% of users with like 1.5 FA. Um, it was really, really, really busy. And like I said, it, it happened at a bad time because support was on parental leave and like our team was actually on like an offsite trip. And so we had just shipped the feature and you're trying to like, you know, deal with this at the same time. It was very difficult. Again, engineers were the front line of triaging. We heard a lot of people's pain. We understood it. We made a few concessions based on some of the extra data we had, but we knew it was only transitory. Um, and, you know, some people liked it, some people didn't. So how do we find out if it was a unrecognized device? Um, nothing changes about the way we're recording the data. Again, we're gonna create an index. In this case, it's a unique index because there will only ever be one user ID and device ID combination. If there was another sign-in, we would reference that record. Uh, again, limited database knowledge, but I do know that adding that unique constraint to the index does make it faster. Um, 
And then we same thing. We have our select for select one, limit one. So only one record. Uh, user ID and device ID, those are in the index. So that's super quick. Now verified at is not in the index. So like why is that okay? Because there's only ever going to be one record. So it only has to check one 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 table or one row whether or not that column is null. So it's not as fast as the fully covered index, but it's practically the same. And I almost wonder if that unique index kind of overcomes that problem. Um, so the verified at value, you know, by default is null. When you first enter your password, we create the authenticated device record, but we not, do not mark it as verified. Once you solve the email-based challenge, we mark it as verified. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of a complication there. It might be an implementation detail, but again, this is what we did, and this is what worked very, very well. Uh, Steve's a busy person. Uh, he hates waiting for those stupid emails, but you know what? He's still not going to use 2FA. Uh, you know, 2FA is still worse, in his opinion. But let's talk, let's introduce another character, uh, Joe Hacker here. Always uses an incognito session. Uh, so his life just became a major, major pain. <laughs> They always use a unique randomly generated password. They will not turn 2FA. But they, they does use a small set of IP addresses. So maybe it's OK to skip the challenge if they're coming from one of those. So again, we have all the records of the sign-ins. We used the country codes at one point. But now we can use the IP addresses that says, if this isn't a known device, but it's a known IP address, uh, then you can go by. Now, we did consider this use case in the initial rollout. And we did talk about it at length. And we did decide not to support this use case in the beginning. But the response was overwhelming, and we knew we had to sort of acquiesce in a sense. So um, this was a case where I think we had gone too far. We listened to the people, and we gave them the user experience that they wanted. Now, we sacrificed a little bit of security in that sense, because an IP address is not assigned to an individual. If you're behind a large NAT, you all have the same public IP address. Um, but we didn't think that was a big enough risk to sort of change any of these things. And if you happen to be on the same address as a person you're trying to attack, well, that's probably a targeted attack at that point. And like I said, we're not focusing on targeted attacks here. And again, the SQL query, uh, create an index on the user IP or user ID and the AP address. It cannot be unique in this case because, again, they're signing in from the same address. And select one, limit one. Uh, the where clause only includes things that are in the index. This query is essentially free. So, um, you know, we've added all this protection with three essentially free queries, which is pretty darn good. Now, the most important part here, uh, clean up these tables. As you might imagine, these tables can get quite large. As you can imagine, those indexes that we put everywhere can get quite large as well. Well, not only, shouldn't, not only should you delete this data for like privacy reasons, but it's really not useful after like six months. Um, you know, if someone moves, their, their pattern is going to change. So if I lived in the United States and I moved to Europe and I signed in from the United States and I haven't been there in 10 years, that's a problem. Um, so cleaning it up for, for data retention, cleaning it up for privacy, cleaning it up for, you know, the DBA's sanity, um, all good reasons to do it. But really, there's no reason to keep this data around forever. So that was the, the device verification flow. I, like I said, I, I try to simplify it to, to three queries, but I definitely don't want to to dismiss any troubles that people would have. Um, I don't know if there's anything that I could kind of clarify in that previous section, but that was the meat of it. No, I think that was good. I got it. The chat's quiet, so I think uh, audience is, is good on that. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, so in addition to the <laughs> the people who sort of demanded the, oh. the IP address bypass there, and we called it a bypass. That's That's kind of what it is. Um, <clears throat> you know, again, the, the question of opting out came in. Should we allow people to opt out of this behavior? And just like everything else, we decided no. Uh, if you really don't like this, try using 2FA because you'll get past this. And some people, you know, they said, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll finally do it. Like, <laughs> this has become a bigger pain in the butt than using 2FA <laughs> is. So I'm going to use that. Uh, you know, because again, like waiting for an email is, you know, even waiting for an SMS can be annoying sometimes. And email is always slower than SMS. So uh, you know, maybe we don't need to move everyone to app-based 2FA, but if we could at least get them to use SMS 2FA, that'll make their lives easier. $25 Amazon gift card if you sign up for 
to a thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't I know. Guess... I get. Okay. No, it's just like they do that with the vaccines, and it's not that it's not working well either. There, so. All right, controversial topic, but anyway, paying <laughs> people to do things still, I don't know. Um, so, so you know, like twenty years ago, like the biggest thing we would be protecting are like credit card numbers, social security card numbers, like PII of all kind. And then Bitcoin came out, and like that's all people cared about now. So, personal identifier PII was now safe by virtue of Bitcoin because that was more lucrative. Um, but yeah, like third-party sites would offer incentives if you had one of our accounts. So. You sign up with their service with our account. They get information about your account. They want to verify that you didn't just create it. So the account has to be over a year old. So guess what? The you know, Every time someone would incentivize having a GitHub account for something, we'd see another wave of attacks. And we'd see these accounts get stolen. And, and they didn't steal the data. They didn't do anything. They just use it to get incentives on other sites. So it was economical to steal GitHub accounts to get perks on other sites, uh, which was always fun. Wow. Yeah. So we would actually tell companies like, please don't do this. You're painting a big target on a lot of people who you know, aren't taking care of their accounts. Um, but again, once we had the notifications in place, once we had the, the device verification challenges, we didn't really have any concerns anymore. And so we, we saw the uh, attack pattern change here. You know, we, we used to watch attacks against the website and then they just plummeted. And we knew this would happen. You know, like I said, we you can still use your password to use the version on the command line. You can still your, use your password to hit the API. So unsurprisingly, the attack shifted to the API. Uh, I think it was like a matter of days before we saw the first attack shift, and it was a matter of like weeks before everything had entirely shifted over to the API. Frankly, I would have started with the API because that's way more efficient. You can definitely check if accounts compromised way more quickly with a web API than loading a web page and submitting a web form and Yes, you can do that with an automated tool, but it's still going to be faster to use the API. Steve doesn't know what an API is. Um, so if you're ever to receive an email about this, he probably wouldn't know what to do, uh, but he definitely won't contact support. Um, you know, you can't put a big red dismissible banner across someone's uh, API response. Um, so we kind of thought, like, should we ban compromised passwords? Well, maybe, but... You know, most API responses aren't consumed by humans. Most people won't read their email, as we've already kind of established. Um, so we had to kind of come up with a different plan. So instead of banning bad passwords, we just decided to ban passwords altogether. Um, we kind of came up with this stance that says passwords should only ever be used in a web browser. And the reason we say that is because web browsers have password manager support. So, you know, the desktop application, the command line application, um, you know, mobile apps, everything goes through a browser-based flow that gives us all sorts of guarantees. There are no guarantees on the command line. There are no guarantees on an API. Um, but a password manager is, again, origin-bound so that it can be protected from phishing. So if a password is never entered outside of a browser and the password only ever comes from a password manager, that is a pretty strong position to be in. But if you accept a password on a random API, it's kind of pointless. Uh, and I think this is really like, all the, all the things we did to get to this point were very important, but being able to declare that passwords shall never be entered outside of a browser was a good like, you know, way to think about things. So if, if something new came up, it would be like, no, like we cannot accept a password outside of a browser. You need to work with this flow. Um, and that presented challenges when some of the API calls would only work with a password. Um, how do you ban passwords, but you have APIs that require passwords? Well, we had to get rid of those APIs and we had to introduce new flows. Um, you know, The command line flow goes through the OAuth device authorization flow instead of, again, a password. Uh, and it's just so much more secure and it's such a better, better place to be in, really. So, uh, once we banned passwords from the API, the next thing was to ban passwords against the command line interface. Um, we, we did not expect to see another shift against this attack, and sure enough, that became true. Uh, attacking subversion with the password is not impossible, but it's also not very easy or well understood or as easy to automate. But we did not see any attack shift, so that meant that we stopped the attacks. And 
credential stuffing was no longer a concern. So finally, Steve can rest easy. Um, he really didn't do much in this journey. He did change his password once, so we have to give him credit for that. But now he can know that his account is reasonably secure. Um, and he didn't have to change his ways drastically. He didn't have to check any boxes. He didn't have to know about what to opt into. It just happened. And so, yeah, uh, how did I know we were successful? Like I said, we, we would every sign-in would be tagged with whether or not it was an unrecognized device or an unrecognized country, whether or not it used a bad password. Um, and eventually, you know, once the attacks kind of stopped, we'd see that you know a, a consistent percentage of sign-ins would come from unrecognized devices. A consistent amount of sign-ins would come in from unrecognized country and devices. But if you ever saw the combination of both of them and that number spiked, that's a successful credential stuffing attack against your website. Um, that number is the scariest number. And as you can see, I've just taken two metrics and combined them into one, into the are we being attacked metric. Um, and uh, when that number fluctuates, it's bad. The end. Cool. So there's a, <clears throat> a question in the chat that is around from Cleveland Josh. I'll, I'll just read it. Uh, is there a good paper or write up for understanding how to create or structure free queries? And then they go further to say, I understand your examples, but how do you break a use case down to make the query as free as possible? Um, so database indexes are incredibly important. Um, they and like I said, if, if, if the columns that you're asking for or the columns that you're limiting your query on are inside the index, um, the database engine will search that data first. And it can search that data incredibly efficiently. Uh, hash tables, something, something, I don't know the details exactly. Um, but it gives the makes it so the database doesn't have to scan over every single record that's returned. Um, and then in that one query with the uh, verified at column that was not part of the, the index, um, had that not been a unique index and had there been multiple records with those matching user ID and device IDs, that would have been a slow query. That would have eventually been a problem. Because yes, it can limit it to those columns, but it's still going to have to go through each one individually. And you know, if you want to talk about like scaling, like if you have three records, that's not a problem. But if you have ten million records and you allow this to exist, that will be a problem. Um, so if you if you're including data that is non-indexed, you need to make sure that it it will not turn into a sort of a pathological case like that. Um, <clears throat> if you want to like Google a few terms, covering index, I think covered index, I think is the term, um, and that will kind of explain the, the benefits to that. And indexes are a very complicated thing. I think the company named Vivid Cortex has a few good um, videos and documents explaining indexes, and it definitely helped me understand things a lot better. Um, you know, even the order of the index matters. Um, if you use a like clause, where that percent sign is matters. Um, these things are not like. <coughs> I don't, I don't know, even at, at having spent some time learning this stuff, I f still feel like it's terribly unintuitive to some degree. Um, but if your database indexes are not correct, you'll know pretty quickly when, when people can't sign in and when people can't sign in, it's kind of hard to use the website. So um, getting that right is very important. And um, you know, we, we, we instrumented the whole process too to make sure that this, this you know, check that we're doing isn't taking too long or um, doesn't, you know, take longer over time. Uh, and then once we got it to a specific place, it was like, yeah, we, we would look at the, the performance time and we're talking like sub millisecond query times, which is essentially free. And then I had a question around, um, so, you know, in your example, a lot of this looks like it was custom built for, to solve these use cases around, you know, Creden detecting credential stuffing and responding to credential stuffing. It, are there any, <clears throat> like you mentioned Rails, does like devise or more of these common authentication authorization sort of libraries, D does anything out there help, um, I don't know, incentivize this type of behavior or, or designing this, make it easier to design this? Or are you on your own here, like kind of going off the road here, building this yourself? I haven't used devise in probably like eight years or so. So I can't, I can't speak to it. Um, I think the, like the whole idea of like an email based challenge might be
be something that they offer out of the box, but like kind of, you know, the, the known IP address allowance, I don't know if that's really like part of it. Uh, but yes, this was like a custom authentication stack. Uh, and I, I mean, I know it, eight years ago, Devise was, was a great tool. So I hope it's only gotten better. Um, and at least maybe some of this is like pluggable to some degree. So if there's just like a, a hook that you can run on every authentication challenge to then add this code to, it's probably an easy way to do it. But yeah, I don't think you can just credential stuffing on checkbox sort of deal. Yeah, I mean, obviously you can't abstract it that far. I was just wondering if stuff like this is getting built into common authentication libraries beyond device or, you know, any anything. But well, I guess speaking of common it. libraries, it's like I'm pretty sure this is like a, a standard of some kind that somebody has outlined, but I, ha I haven't read it. So I, I don't think any of this stuff is necessarily novel either. So there, there probably are other resources out there um, explaining similar systems. And it looks like we have another question in the chat from one tall lady 78. So what are your thoughts on companies going away from passwords as being part of their 2FA like Yahoo? They make it an option, but force most users to use other auth options before passwords. Yeah, this is, uh... This is definitely a more of like a, I guess you would say like cutting edge sort of deal. And this also kind of ties back to WebAuthn in a way, but um, the idea of like a passwordless flow um, is pretty common nowadays. I think the way Yahoo's works is, yeah, like you sign in and they send a push message to your phone that then has a code that you enter. Um, and you can do that without entering a password. And I think Microsoft, when you set up your accounts, they will just email you a code. Um, I do think this is kind of a, a way of, of kind of declaring that, yeah, passwords are terrible. Um, and these other things like aren't really that bad. Um, you know, oh, like somebody has your phone, they can steal your code. Well, don't give people your phone, like hold on to it. Um, you should, you should do this or like, you know, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one example. Um, the Microsoft email thing is another, but I think is really cool and I really want to see everywhere. And unfortunately I don't think the technology is ready. I, I mentioned back to that web auth end thing. Um, WebAuthn has the idea of resident credentials and apologies to everyone who knows what they're talking about because I'm probably going to butcher some of these things. Um, but there is kind of a way so that like your face ID is your login. Um, you don't provide a username and password. You just authenticate with WebAuthn strongly and you st skip all that and you're signed in immediately. Now, unfortunately, the spec and the implementation is a little bit hairy. So doing this you more or less have to ask for at least the username at this point. Surprise, surprise, getting Microsoft, Apple, and Google to agree on something is hard. Um, but I don't know. I do I do feel like we're, we're headed in the right direction. And in a couple of years, like, signing in with a password will become less and less common on at least the larger websites. Yeah, Face ID is one of the best things that has ever happened to my mom. <laughs> because she literally stores all of her passwords on her phone in the notes app. And before that, it was written down in like a little book. And then she would freak out whenever she lost the book. So yeah, shout out. I think she might be watching today. <laughs> yeah. I love usable security. It's great that uh, that works for them. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about what's wrong with Face ID. Like, oh, like it falls back to a pin. Okay, well, so does your Windows hello. and. Oh, like my, my kid can unlock it with their face. Well, hopefully your kid's not trying to hack your account. But again, like, you know, hang on to your phone, maybe. Um, you know, all, all these sort of things are, are not really things I, I tend to agree with. Like, oh, like, what if someone goes up to your computer and they send an email and then they can read the email? Uh, if someone has access to your computer, you have bigger problems. I would probably just install a keylogger no. or something. Um, so all these threats that people kind of talk about are, are real. But like, are they enough to to not use a technology? No, absolutely not. Yeah, I'm curious to know, like, if we can use people's voices, like, how unique is someone's voice, where we send them like a sentence or something, and then they have to say the sentence, so that you can't just say like, unlock my phone, and then someone records it and reuses that. Like, I don't know anything about voices, though. So, or how this scared they are. This YouTube channel or your voice already in the last hour might be enough to uh, mm -hmm. unlock or create a <laughs> fake, deep fake of your voice yep. and, and subvert that. But yeah, I don't know. I, I, what are your thoughts there? <clears throat> um, 
Yeah, I mean, I de definitely have thought about it, and yeah, like the 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 nonce attribute to making everything unique would definitely uh, go a long way. But yeah, I don't know. So, some options are convenient, and face ID is a little bit more convenient than reading something, maybe. And uh, I don't know. There's probably a lot of accessibility concerns there as well that I haven't really thought about too much, too. Yeah. But um, I'm all for if if we can do that in a safe way, and if it's usable for people, like I'm all for more factors. Um, and this actually something I, did, I didn't really mention in the talk. It's funny, I thought I had a slide, but like, like the more factors you have, the more recoverable your account is. So let's, let's talk about the people who are using 2FA, for example. Um, they enrolled with OTP and they have two security keys, uh, but then they also have the app installed on their phone, their iPad, their, uh, do, do people have two iPads? I don't know. <laughs> it's on multiple devices at that point, right? And let's say your OTP was stored on your phone, your security keys got smashed, they don't work anymore. Um, but and you wiped your, your phone, so the app's gone from there, but you still have it on your iPad, that is great because now you're not locked out anymore. So the more factors you have, the better it is for recovery. And use your judgment on your threat model where installing an app in multiple places is good enough or not, but you probably got your email account on both and that's pretty dangerous. So uh, I don't think this is any more dangerous. So TLDR, um, get a burner phone. <laughs> <laughs> or buy three security keys, I don't know. Uh, one tall lady has one more question. Um, you're, so you prefer biometrics as a factor despite some of the accuracy with facial recognition, deduping fingerprints and voice voice using push notifications and account keys. I guess, does biometrics kind of win there? Uh, In spite like, of I think it's less about biometrics and more about the fact that it's origin bound and cannot be fished. I think that's that's kind of the most important thing here, and you know, even Face ID, like I said, falls back to pins. So biometric falling back to a knowledge base challenge, um, again, which makes some people uncomfortable, but most people are, are okay with this. And um, I think things like facial recognition and fingerprints have always been problematic, but I do feel like they're at least improving. Um, and the usability that comes with it is is quite significant. It doesn't negate the fact that there are problems with these things, but everything has trade-offs and yeah. I feel comfortable using these tools. And sometimes I do have to fall back to a pin and that's fine with me. Um, but something like Windows Hello, for example, I think defaults to using a pin. And, um, you know, that makes some people uncomfortable as well. Um, hopefully people choose unique pins, but we know they probably won't. Cool. And just to clarify, I think the context was versus other two factors. Oh. Um, so biometrics versus other two factors. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I, guess I would just because uh, pe people don't lose their faces, but people lose their OTP codes. A lot. I mean, that's not true. I mean, I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> biometrics can change this is this is true but uh hopefully it's not a common enough case to either get someone locked out because they were fully dependent on it um, but most places that will offer a biometric solution will offer a non-biometric solution as well and i think people can pick and choose but i'm going to choose the convenient option pretty much every time yeah cool. that's most users yeah well, I think that is it for chat questions. Any other, I guess, final takeaways or? Uh, turn on 2FA. <laughs> <laughs> no, but All if right. anyone has any questions, um, you know, definitely happy to talk about it more. I, I really, really enjoy this topic. Um, I'm going to continue working in this space going forward. And uh, it's hard to get right. Yeah, no, and it's a good perspective, right? Like going against sort of that conventional idea that might not be as usable as possible with other alternative solutions that are equally as secure, I think is a really great thing for the security industry to always reevaluate, right? Because we make these assumptions and then five years go by and we're still there. And maybe it's time to revisit some of those assumptions. So I think this was a great talk. We still have yeah. places that force password changes periodically. <laughs> Yeah, I guess they get baked into some compliance standard, and then it, they're just stuck. We're just stuck with them forever. Is that is that the problem? Is compliance the root of all evil? <laughs> well, I won't comment on that. <laughs> <laughs>
Did you, were you going to say something, Sri? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, uh, we talked about uh, UX and like how that's important. And I think there is a comment here from someone who also found this presentation to be very helpful. I'm really glad to uh, hear that. Um, yeah, they're saying thank you. But they did call out something pretty important, which is that we should also consider accessibility. Um, and I think that is a whole other topic for another day, perhaps. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here with us today, um, Neil. This was super informative. And I feel like most people have a vague idea of why like security is important or that it's important at all but you know after today i think you really called out some of the dangers and how what we can do to you know protect ourselves um in a very easy to understand manner so yeah is there is there any way that people can contact you if they have more questions stay in touch uh you can find me at ndm on twitter uh i'm open dms i'm i'm pretty responsive there i spend too much time on that website so uh, it's probably the best way to reach me okay awesome well if you guys liked what you saw today and you want to see more check out the devslop youtube where you can find older episodes and i think uh at some point this recording will also be up there um devslop is also on twitter at de o w a s p underscore devslop and instagram O W A S P Devslop, where um, we post about upcoming shows. Next week, I believe we will be joined by Or Weiss, who's going to talk about building modern access for cloud applications. You can find all this info in the description of the show's recording on YouTube, along with our hosts and our producers' Twitter and LinkedIn handles. So this was Devslop with Shanisa and Nikki. Uh, produced by our producer, Nancy, and I am Shri. We were here today with Neil. Uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Neil. Bye.